Hey everyone, and welcome to our webcast today, How Portal Can Change Your Security Forever. The presentation Katie gave during her Besides Las Vegas this year. Uh, this webcast is going to be about 45 minutes long with time to answer questions at the end. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the whole presentation um, by typing them in the GoToWebinar questions pane, and we'll answer those after the presentation. We're also recording this, um, so we'll make it available to you this afternoon along with her slides and um, a forum thread to ask any further questions. So on to our speaker. Katie is our security program manager here at Bug Crowd with over 12 years of experience in behavioral psychology, information technology, curriculum strategy, and much, much, much more. <laughs> Um, at Bug Crowd, she focuses on fostering the quality of our crowd and helping researchers advance their technical skills and overall performance. Without further ado, Katie, take it away. Great, thanks. Um, so again, this is uh, my name is Katie. I've been kind of working with behavior and cognition and all those types of wonderful psychology things for a while now. And uh, this talk originally was, was titled How Portal Can Change Your Security Forever. But as I started to create it and modify it and just generally make it, it turned into a lot more of how, how do you use not just games like Portal, but how do you use different types of game theory to change behavior. And specifically, it can be to security, but this talk will also talk about if you're a manager and you're developing a team, what are the different, you know, what, what are the important parts of game theory to create a really effective team? Um, your own, it could be to increase your own behavior, but it, so it really is how games can change your behavior forever. So with that, what are we going to talk about? Um, and it's a very big misconception about gamification and game theory is that it's all about badges. I'm sure you have seen or heard somebody use the word gamification, gamify, and then suddenly you see a whole bunch of badges and levels and achievements and stars, and it, it's, it's not necessarily everything that's happening. We're actually not going to talk about any of those things today. We're going to talk about the little basic concept of what exactly you're doing when you're making a game. Badges and achievements and levels contribute to that. But it's their smaller parts, their smaller tools to the bigger, the bigger picture. And that bigger picture is this concept of a learning curve, which is what you see right here. Um, and I'll go over that in more detail. But it's a game is really all about keeping somebody away from the edges, away from those extremes long enough, and keeping them in the middle where it's a little bit more of a challenge, it's more rewarding, it's more exciting, and how you use different techniques and different strategy to do that. So with that, uh, this is actually, uh, when I gave this talk at B-Sides, I like to talk to everybody and interact. And so while I can't talk to you and interact with you, uh, if you feel free to respond in the questions panel. But uh, this is, there's a variety of games. I, I talked to several of my friends and said, hey, you know, I need some examples of some things as well as doing some of the games myself. And they came back with some pretty interesting ones. If you know what this game is, go ahead and, and type it in there and I'll say it at some point. But uh, this is the very beginning of one of these games, and it's a game where it is a linear game, which we'll talk about, where you go from level to level and you achieve things. And one of the first things you see when it's showing you kind of how to navigate and how things are going to happen is every journey is a series of choices. The first is to begin the journey. And for anyone that hasn't yet typed it in, this is called Antichamber. And it's a very interesting game. Visually, it's simple yet strangely complex, but um, it's an interesting game. It's kind of fun, but you'll see kind of examples of this throughout. So let's talk about video games and the learning curve. And specifically, what are these two things? The learning curve is this, uh, it's represented in this graph that we saw earlier, and it's this concept of acquiring a skill over time. And time could be hours and minutes, time could be experience, just it really is this idea of acquiring something. And for, you know, at first glance, it looks, looks pretty simple. Um, as time goes by, you get the skill. But things to point out this extreme. Down at the bottom, as you can notice, uh, there's, less, there's less skill being acquired over a longer period of time. So if you looked at this same, this same distance here, there's a lot more progress being made in the middle there in the same amount of time versus the very, very beginning. 
And while this is necessary, this sometimes is a matter of understanding how to navigate things, what the rules are, getting a basic skill, all things that we'll talk about. This, this is a necessary part of any learning curve. If people live within this space too long, they, they're putting in a lot of time and not seeing a lot of acquisition of a skill or any progress, they get a sense of it's too hard and you start having this. They're like, I'm out. I'm done. I don't want to do it. And this happens in games a lot. Um, we'll go over some of those different ones, one of which being things like Myst. Uh, that was for different reasons, but people lived in the bottom of this curve so long that they dropped the game. Didn't get to the end because they're like, I don't get it. Don't want to do this. It's too hard. And the difficulty didn't outweigh any sort of motivator to keep going on, so they just stopped. On the other end of the curve is actually the very top, so it's the other extreme in that you've acquired the skill, which is great, but now you're just living, you're still not seeing as much progress in your skill acquisition, but part of it is because you're pretty much almost at 100%. You've almost gotten the skill down perfectly. So you start getting the sense of, I'm bored, which is just as dangerous as things being too difficult. If you're not intellectually challenged in your game, your behavior, your job, your position, whatever it might be, this happens. And again, these are the two areas where, pe where games get lost. Um, where crowds get, um, get, you start seeing them go other places because they're not being challenged or because it's too difficult. We actually see this as, at Bug Crowd as well. And we have several things that we're in the middle of doing as well as we've employed to make sure that the individuals that are really just starting out with bug bounties, that we can help them with resources. We have the forum, we have the community, all this kind of stuff happens to where we can really help them kind of get farther and get through that difficult time but then also people that are really, really, really talented, making sure that we're giving them challenges and um, really challenging them to keep them, ultimately, just like any good game, in here, in this sweet spot, to where it's not too difficult, but it's not too easy either. They're acquiring a skill, they're seeing progress, they're putting forth effort, and they're getting challenged. There's, there's things below them, but there's also something to look forward to. So within this learning curve, there's different, as far as games are concerned, the learning curve is used in different ways. So there's a linear, there's linear play games. And these include things like Angry Birds, Candy Crush, Zelda. I got to throw back to some of the original ones right there. That was making me happy. Um, and then things like Portal 2, which you see at the bottom right. And with these, the reason that they're linear is because they have levels. Clearly, one, one level one or zero and up. And as you proceed through those levels, the learning curve actually exists within each one. So the game is using strategy, is using techniques to make sure that people, it's not too difficult and it's not too bored for that level. But once you go to the next level, it's a new learning curve because you assume that your player, your user, your employee, whatever it might be, has acquired the skill, enough of the skill that you can't keep them there anymore. You need to make it a little bit more challenging. You need to add more difficult uh, opposition. You need to add more difficult landscape. We'll, hold, we'll, we'll talk about the different ways to make things more difficult, but regardless, it's this concept that the learning curve lives within each level. So as you progress through the levels, if you say are on level five and you're in the middle of working on beating it, if you go back to level one, you're no longer going to live in that sweet spot. Even if the game was perfect at it, you were super engaged in level one. If you're at level five now, you're going to come back and it's going to be too boring for you. You're going to scream through it because you've surpassed that particular learning curve um, because it, it lives within each game. So these are, these are interesting games. These, like I said, these really include things like Angry Birds, Candy Crush, Zelda, Portal. And what you definitely see with these is that the user is less likely to go back and play the game again. Uh, with Portal 2, good game, just like Portal 1, good game. Uh, but people don't generally tend to play it more than once because once you've played it, it's, you're pretty much done. You've done it already. Uh, this occurs with uh, within security as well. Think about it when it comes to training. If you have given somebody some initial training, level one, you know, a skill acquisition, okay, the intermediate one and the advanced one, they don't want to go back to the first one. It's not going to help them. It's past their skill level. They need new training, new things to keep progressing through this. And where you can see a failure sometimes in this and then therefore some dissatisfaction among employees, teammates, is when things like training are given annually, but the skill level is not considered. So you require a significant amount of attention to something that happens to be below their skill level now, and therefore they're quite bored. 
and this is where you start getting dissatisfaction with things. So linear gameplay, uh, it's just really games that go from, from lowest to highest, and as you progress through, going back will we'll uh, proceed with you being bored. The next time we have here is a non-linear play game. And this includes things like Dota, League of Legends, um, on EVE Online, and in this, this isn't really that you have specific, if you're uh, not super familiar with these, it's not really that you have individual levels that you go through, and each level has the learning curve uh, modified to it. What it really is, is that you have a learning curve, and rather than modifying the level, you're modifying things like opponents, tools, skills, and teammates. And so, for example, in Dota, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, uh, a couple weeks back was like the championships. Uh, one of my coworkers is really into it, plays it a lot, and therefore I watched some of it. Um, so it was pretty cool. But what I saw there, it was very interesting to watch, even though I hadn't played it. Um, and Evil Genius is one in case anybody wants to know. Um, the, the interesting thing to, to do was in watching Dota um, and asking a whole bunch of questions, it was really interesting to see the complexity of the different tools and the skills and the opponents. Um, what happens is that you have a, a team and you can play the same level over and over again and you're doing the same general task, but the things that are being changed is that your a collective skill of your team is matched with an appropriate set of opponents to where you're never going to play anyone that's significantly higher in skill than you or significantly lower because, again, you'd be too bored or it'd be too hard. Similar things that happen is that there's different types of skills you have to, to choose from and different types of strategy that you have to employ with this. So again, with things like Dota, there's like 100 characters that each have their own special thing. And it's not just you against a team. It's you and that player and its skills interacting with the other four teammates that you have, making sure that your team is put together in such a way that it's going to be sufficient to go against their team and the skills that they've picked in their characters. And as you get better and better and are able to get more and more things, those skills and those tools that you have get more and more complex. And therefore, you can play the same level over and over again and still live within this middle space here. Um, but it's not because the level changed, but because of outside skills. This is seen a lot more in the workforce um, when creating a team. You don't change a level for your coworkers. Um, you don't change the, you, you change the skills that they have, the, the tools. Um, their teammates, the clients that they have to interact with, the challenges that they see. Effective teams and a lot of allegiance to those teams and hard work are seen when you, you don't just say, okay, here's your basic skill set and we're not doing anything. Some companies will actually have you have to do a routine um, cycle to different teams to where you, you don't always work with the same people. And while some people might, some coworkers might initially have some adverse reaction to it, what happens with this and the strategy behind this is that you're requiring, if you've created a really good team there, if somebody leaves, you're going to get another teammate and they're going to have strengths and weaknesses that the rest of the team can both, uh, they might have to up their game on certain things that they're doing to make up for something that they lost. But then that new teammate's also going to add new challenges as well as new skill that the other people can learn from. And you start having, again, a more complex and more challenging thing. Not too bored, not too, uh, too hard. Uh, the same thing that's also very helpful are that facilitation of skills and tools. So one of the things that happens at Google, it used to, I think it still does, is that they have a specific amount of time that co-work, like you have time to go work on another project that's not related to your work. And this sounds really ridiculous to some people, especially in a very traditional work mindset, but what it's doing is it's having them go think of other things, other skills, other tools, other ideas, and in doing that at work and just around work constantly, it's going to be instilled into their actual work as well. If they start thinking about economic theory, they're gonna start applying it and using it for a project. That process, those thoughts are going to leak into their other things and it's gonna start creating a more complex and a more rich environment for problem solving in other areas of their job, for interacting with other teammates, um, for interacting with other opponents. Similarly, people that go to conferences, uh, companies that pay for you to continue your education or on whatever it might be, people that are always learning and companies that encourage that 
are really able to create a more dynamic um, environment for their users and their learners and create a more solid team that constantly is growing and is constantly challenged because they're keeping them in that sweet spot of a learning curve. So it's it's a pretty cool concept um, to use. So I, I, I get really jazzed about that. So. <laughs> So now that we've talked about the different types of games and how the learning curve lives within them, there's actually different looks to the learning curve. The one that we've been looking at is called the steep learning curve, and this is where uh, in a very you, you have less skill acquisition and suddenly, bam, I've got the skill. It's here, it's done, and I'm, I'm ready. Uh, this is considered a steep learning curve because there's such a sudden increase in skill acquisition. You, you basically don't know it, and now you do. In some cases, people consider this a difficult one. Uh, there are certain games like the Kerbal State Space Program, uh, Dota, EVE Online, where they consider this a steep learning curve, where you do, you spend a lot of time figuring out how to just navigate, but once you have it, you suddenly see a lot of progress in your ability to be able to play the game. In some cases, this is a really good thing. Uh, sometimes it's just necessary. So. Some people will say, oh, it's a steep learning curve, let's fix it. Sometimes the steep learning curve is good. It's required, you really have to understand the fundamentals in a game. For example, you need to understand what keys go to what in order to be able to play the game. So it's not necessarily always a bad thing, but this is a, a steep learning curve. The other type of learning curve you have there is a shallow learning curve. And this is where, as you can tell here, you start seeing progress quicker, but it's slower. It's a much slower process to get to the same spot in the skill acquisition as compared to a, a steep learning curve. And games like this include like Angry Birds, Mario Kart, uh, Super Smash Brothers, like stuff like that to where you're spending, you spend time and you get slow progress. Sometimes it's so gradual that you don't realize how far you've progressed until you go back. Let's say you, you're playing Angry Birds, you're doing pretty well, um, and then you're like, oh yeah, here, let me help my friend with level two, and you're like a whiz at it. You didn't realize how well you did because the, the slope can be very gradual. Again, in some cases, this is fantastic. Uh, having a shallow learning curve uh, really helps with the game. It depends on what kind of game, what kind of behavior you're looking at. Um, in some cases, this isn't the best, but these are the different types of curves that you do end up having. So again, at B-Sides, I kind of asked some people, so you can kind of think about it. Uh, this, this is a cool game. <laughs> it's called Super X, uh, in which case this little triangle here, I, I would show you a video, but um, go look it up. It's, it's a trippy looking game. <laughs> uh, I think it has 10 levels, I think. And what happens is this little triangle, you have to keep it from hitting a wall. And this essentially just keeps kind of, kind of going. So you put the triangle here, and then you put the triangle here as all these rings start going in. Um, so go check it out and, and uh, kind of think about if you think, if you know what this is already, uh, try to think to yourself if you think this would be a steep or a shallow learning curve. Similarly, we have James Bond here, 007, Goldeneye. It's a fun game. I love this game. I, and most people are very familiar with it, but based on what we just heard about steep and shallow learning curves, just think about what you think this would be. Would this playing this game be a steep or a shallow learning curve? And as you start kind of thinking about the different games or even the different behaviors that you do see that you're doing, whether it's bug bounties, career development, programming, whatever, management, who knows what it might be, think of if, if those things are a steep or shallow learning curve because that's really going to help in some of the next things we're talking about. So one of the final things we talk about as far as the learning curve is concerned before we talk about how to manipulate it is intellectual complexity. And this happens a lot when we're talking about the different types of games, like I like this one versus this one. Why? Well, because it, it requires more or less out of me. And just colloquially speaking, they generally tend to fall on a spectrum from time filler, so things like Candy Crush, stuff like that, where you can pull this game out on your phone and play it for 15 minutes, five minutes, five hours. Somebody can be arguing at you and you can play this game. Like, it doesn't require a huge amount of attention for you to be able to play it and get rewarded and to see progress. Uh, you're able to just kind of go through the game and understand it. Uh, these are extremely popular because they can just fill time for you. I've got five minutes. Okay, great. Let's play this game. On the other end of the spectrum, you have complete immersion games. This one happens, again, to be Dota. 
Um, I one of my friends, like I said, has been playing this game for ten years, so a lot of the examples from from him came from Dota. So anyway, with that, with things like a complete immersion game, this requires not just okay, great, yeah, I've got this basic skill of moving candy around and you know matching things. You have to understand strategy. You have to understand the world. You have to understand what's going on with everybody. You have so many things that you're juggling your head. In addition, if you stop in the middle of a level, you die. You could die. And your teammate and the game that you're playing, the same thing happens with EVE Online, can falter. You cannot just stop. You have to start and finish a level. Otherwise, you get punished for it. With things like Candy Crush, there's really not a punishment for stopping. You can just stop for a minute. It's not a big deal. But with complete immersion techniques, there's so many things that you're juggling. There's so many things that you're handling. There's so many things you're keeping in the air and so many things that are dependent upon you and your performance that you cannot just stop. The complete immersion is what you see a lot more with um, those higher level careers. Those things that you that you are doing that require you to think of strategy, to understand your teammate, to understand the threat environment, to understand the resource that you have, the skills, what you're deficient at, what your teammate can do. This is very much what you see in a intellectually challenging career. This is what you deal with every single day, uh, which is just personified in the game, which is fun. In the middle, you also have a gray area. So not all games are time fillers or complete immersion. You have to actually have a huge number that are in the middle to where you really do need to complete and finish a, a level, but you can pause. So this would be things like Portal 2, Mario, Halo 2. Like You can pause the game, and everything will wait for you to come back. But in the same sense, though, you can't just play it for like five minutes. You really need a little bit more amount of time to be able to play it. You could play a level, but most people don't do that. So uh, with that, it's, it's kind of interesting. The concept of intellectual complexity when it comes to a game, though, where things can kind of go awry, is where the task, the game, whatever it might be, is designed for, a, for one of the ends of the spectrum, or the middle, but it's, it requires the other. So let's think, for example, if you have, this happens a lot in training, and I know that there are good examples that, that don't do this, but a poor, training experience is that it is designed with the intellectual complexity again this is in sorry this is in relation to your audience the intellectual complexity of the audience so it has the intellectual complexity of a time filler for your audience but it demands their complete immersion they have to sit and pay attention to this and only this for 45 minutes i'm sure a lot of you can think of examples where you've had to experience this you've had to go through this and you probably loved it when I was talking to people at B-Sides and when I talked to anyone about this, everybody rolls their eyes and can think of an experience that they actually hated this. And it's not because the training is really that bad, but it's, it really is because it's a time filler exercise that is demanding a complete immersion intellectual complexity. The same thing can happen in the opposite direction. Uh, this happens a lot with multitasking. This could be something that really demands your complete immersion. There's strategy, there's things up in the air, there's things you have to do but you attend to it in a time filler manner. And this is where things get too difficult, things get dropped on the floor, you don't see as much progress happening because it's too difficult and you're not able to attend to it as much as you need to. So this happens, happens in different ways. Across this, you really can have, the, the learning curve can vary for this. You can have things with a very steep learning curve that are time fillers. It doesn't happen as much though because with a time filler, there's not time to learn. Like You really need to start seeing progress very quickly. That's why you see a lot of time fillers that have a shallow learning curve. That you very quickly can see skill acquisition. Um, there's not a lot of difficulty, and it's fine. Complete immersion can also have a, a shallow learning curve, but those are the ones that thrive more as a steep learning curve uh, to where you do end up seeing there is some difficulty, there's some things that happen before you actually start acquiring those skills. So now that we've talked about the basics of a learning curve and how it relates to behavior overall and games, we need to talk about manipulating that curve because that's what games are all about. That's why I find it really interesting um, to actually watch people play a really well-balanced game is because you can see all of these things and these tools and these rules being changed and these techniques and features being implemented that are all for the purpose of manipulating the curve to the group as well as the individual. So everything has to start at the beginning. So let's start with starting a game. 
for any of you that again are, are paying attention to this particular particular part, um, go ahead and tell me if you know what this game is. Uh, I will I'll tell you in a second. Uh, but this is a pretty cool game. It is a linear game. Uh, visually, I really suggest uh, looking it up, looking at some gameplay, because artistically it's very, very pretty. But it says, Tim is off on a search to rescue the princess. She has been snatched by a horrible and evil monster. This happened because Tim made a mistake. The reason I bring this one up, um, it's, a, it's a pretty cool game. It's called Braid. And it, it's really interesting because the very beginning of it, it does a really good job at creating foundational skills. It has a really good example. So it's a game that you play on your computer, and creating foundational skills is, is part of that, that learning curve in that it's the very beginning. It's really helping somebody get through that first part of the curve that it's difficult by helping them sometimes just navigate. So for Braid, as you start playing, you come across something. This is the very first level, and it says press space bar. So when you get there, you do, and you jump. And then suddenly you get to this lattice and you just it, you have this up button okay great I pressed up oh look I climb and these are great ways that the game has been created to help the person seamlessly get through understanding how to navigate their environment and get out of it it's too difficult this may seem pretty no duh so there's some other examples this happens to be from antechamber from before it literally just says click here do this at another point you get to it just says jump just do it and no questions here. It's helping you navigate your environment and getting through what could be an unnecessary, it's too difficult time. Another one I have here uh, is you are walk what you do is you start off in the dark and you walk through and the, all those lines rec uh, represent noise bouncing off of things so that you can see where you are. Like right here, they're in a hallway. This is a bigger space. And this very first part here says find the exit. That's the whole point of the game is to find the exit. But as you do, you learn different skills and different tasks to locate the exit. Sometimes there's a wall. Sometimes there's a, a dangerous monster. There's a whole bunch of things that happen. But these are all things to help you create foundational skills. And it may seem like a no-duh thing, but there, have, there are games that I'm sure you can think of where they didn't help you with this. Mist was one of them. They dropped you in a world. And you can walk around, that's fine, but you didn't know what pressing buttons meant, what things did, what needed to happen, and what you had was people just walking around randomly pressing stuff trying to figure it out. And you had so many people quit because they're just like, I have no idea what to do. Am I pressing something? Is this doing anything? Is this just this aesthetic? But without that help with foundational skills, they're not able to get to that it's too difficult. This happens as well with creating a team, developing a skill, you have to create those foundational skills. If you just start in the thick of it, you're going to have such a hard time basically going back and understanding the basics that the chance for just quitting are very high. The other thing that happens in starting a game is you have a very high reward schedule. I, I'm sure a lot of you recognize this game here. Super Mario Brothers, got to love it. I really love it. <laughs> and this is the very first part of the very first level. And we're going to break this down. This gives you so many foundational skills as well as kind of gives you some skills for later. And it has such a high reward schedule that helps with that. So first off, if you've played this, you recognize there are four things that you reward you can get here. You're probably going to walk forward. Now we know how to walk. Fantastic. Uh, you're either going to initially hit that question mark. The question mark is indicating like, hey, something's here. You're going to hit that question mark and realize, oh my gosh, I get coins here. The next thing you usually discover is that that little mush, angry mushroom is a bad guy and you can't run into him. So if you were able to avoid that initially, now it's time to try again. You jump on him. We now know how to jump. Again, we've navigated. Um, and we know how to kill an enemy. We're also going to probably go to that, that next little question mark, get another coin. You might miss it and hit a block. As you, now you know you can break those blocks. Later in the game, there's actually levels that I'm sure you know where you have to break blocks, so you're learning things for later. And then you're going to get to the third one, I'm pretty sure it's the third one where there's a mushroom in it. And you now know, like, oh my gosh, what is that? You get bigger. Well, part of the cool thing, why would you put that there versus in the top one or the first one or the second one? Well, part of the reason you could put that there is that up until this point you've gotten coins, and coins can be fine, but by putting the mushroom there, not only do you give the player the ability to get bigger and have more life and which that can sustain through the level, but you're also telling them that the rewards here vary. Some of these are going to be coins, and some of these are going to be better. 
and you're going to want these. So go look at all of these, which then motivates the person to go to the top and try that one. Okay, great, because that one's a little bit more difficult to get to. So they, they're going to be motivated to go look for the more difficult things because it might be a higher reward. So already before we've even moved screen, they've learned so much here in creating a foundational skill and it will help them throughout the entire game. If they didn't have a lot of these, these indicators, a lot would probably not happen. That high reward schedule is also helpful because it lets the person know you're doing the right thing. But that has to fade very quickly because otherwise the reward will just become meaningless. So starting in game. The other thing that you have to make sure to do is make sure players are placed within their skill level. Uh, we saw this with things like Dota and Eve and those nonlinear games where you are placed within a game with people that are of similar skill to you so that it's a challenge, it's not too hard and too difficult. Same thing can happen with the linear games. This happens to be Guitar Hero. On the left you have your novice and on the right you have your expert. If people came in on expert, I'm pretty sure Guitar Hero would not have been as successful. There's no way I could have done this initially. But don't worry, a summer of focused concentration and just a lot of, a lot of effort. I, I, I thought it was very, a lot of drive I had that summer to play this game. Um, and I was able to play expert, but I had to get there. You want to make sure that you don't make a game that's too complex for your beginning user. Um, but it's also not too simple. If, if novice was the highest level you could get to, then the game is, is, is not going to go for your audience. But this is all about understanding your audience. So with, with your starting your game, it really is about making sure that nobody lives too much within those extremes once again, just to, just to remember where we are living. The next thing we're going to talk about with manipulating the curve is making a task seem easier, making it easier or making it seem that way. Because sometimes, a lot of the times, especially when it comes to acquiring a skill outside of a game, things are just hard. Um, you, you can't avoid it. So how do you make it easier or make it seem that way? One of the first things you can do is break it down into subtasks. You can then attack, okay, great, I need to be able to do this first thing. I need to be able to learn how to jump. Cool, now I need to be able to learn how to jump farther and a little bit farther and you break it down. This can, this can go with games, this can go with um, learning a new skill, uh, this can actually even go with learning a new physical skill. Let's say that you're trying to learn how to jump over a six foot wall. You're going to start with jumping smaller walls to eventually get to that one and breaking it down into these ideas of subtasks. The other thing that this allows to happen is that with those subtasks, if you're the person that's trying to change the behavior in someone else, you can, then, you can then reward more frequently. So they can see progress a little bit more frequently and feel the motivation to work harder and keep going to that next one. You see this a lot of times in games that have checkpoints, uh, really, really long levels, rather than like, for example, Super Mario Brothers, you didn't have a checkpoint in, I mean, there was very small checkpoints. But it was this idea that if you died, you came back to a certain spot. When Mario went to things like Nintendo 64, you started seeing more checkpoints because some of those levels were really, really long. And you're starting to see the same thing with other games where you're getting longer levels and the task is going to be harder to complete because there's so much you have to do. But you have a checkpoint where if you die or have to leave, you can come back to that spot and you can save your progress. You can also, that becomes a reward because you're like, great, I got to this subtask, I did this sub-level, whatever it might be, and I'm able to get through this. So this also helps with motivating people to keep going forward. Um, this as opposed to just going, great, you did it, we're done, kind of thing. In a very high level, this actually happens with the games, that's why you have your sub-levels. Rather than just going, you started the game, and the game is over, good job, uh, you have levels in between to show you your progress and to say, hey, I'm rewarding you for what you're doing now. It makes the task seem easier. Finally, you have providing outside tools for practice. Sometimes, really you're great, it's going to be difficult. You've, it's more frequent, there's more frequent subtasks, more frequent awards, but there just needs to be more. Now we have to provide outside tools. So for things like Guitar Hero up in the top right, it actually provides you the ability to practice a specific spot. It could be verse number two. You could have a really hard time with the solo on number three, whatever it might be, and you can go in there and play that over and over and over and over again until you feel proficient at it, and then go back and play the full song to increase your overall score. 
The same thing with Mario Kart. Even though there is a single player, um, it, there's there's kind of the joke. The single player is merely just so that you get better. It's outside practice so that when you're playing online with people or you're playing a multiplayer, that you're better. Rather than having to get better among them, you go outside for outside practice to do so. When it comes to skill acquisition and creating a team, this is where things like conferences, training, uh, this is where online skills, uh, online universities, Code Academy, Treehouse, Linda, Udemy, like these things are amazing. And where forums and just the exchange of information is all the concept of, of outside tools for practice. You're going elsewhere to, to learn other things and that significantly influences your overall behavior at your job, in security, that kind of stuff. Uh, this is this is one of the attempts of providing supplemental content training throughout the year. When done successfully, you have your annual training where everyone, okay, great, everyone is, is exhibiting the foundational skills. But that those outside tools that you provide all throughout the year are an attempt for people to be able to do these tasks that may be harder and to make them easier, which is why if you already have the task, you're still getting these, these types of training that people usually don't respond. Um, because it's not challenging them at all. It's not helping them move through a curve. It's just like, okay, well, I already know this, so we're good moving on. So, so the three things you can do to make a task easier or seem that way is to break it down into subtasks, reward more frequently, and provide outside tools for practice. The next part we have here is uh, making a task more difficult. And sometimes this is needed. <laughs> so this this particular slide, sorry, I giggled. Um, the uh, this particular slide is another game. It's kind of it's kind of funny and creepy. If you uh, if you know if you know what it is, go ahead. It's a linear game, um, but it's it was funny what happened at these sides. People were, were were quite amused by this one. So anyway, uh, making a task more difficult. I, one of the ways to do this, and this actually happens a lot in a game. You'll see this very much so. Is that you've acquired your skill. I know how to jump. Well, great. I've got it. I can only jump over so many things before I'm bored. You start adding sub-skills onto your current skills. So for things like Mario or just navigating through a game, if you know how to jump, now you have to jump and bounce off a wall. Or maybe you have to bounce off two walls in order to get to the top. And you're adding sub-skills onto your current skills. And this is different from having different skills that all operate on their own. It's that idea of having to incorporate them together that makes them the challenge. Because you can't just be proficient at one and use it or not use it or use it predominantly. Uh, this can also, this also occurs at work as well. You can see people get bored and leave more when their team, their job, their task, their crew, whatever it might be, they've, they've mastered their skill, so they're getting bored. And nothing is being given to them, done with them, encouraged of them to make the task more difficult, to acquire other sub-skills. The thing I talked about with Google, having people go out and work on other tasks, that's all about that idea of getting other sub-skills and incorporating it into your job and making things more difficult, more challenging, and ultimately more enjoyable because they're living within the sweet spot of the curve. This is an example in a game. This is called, I think it's called Traffic Control, but it's on, I think it's on the iPad predominantly. I don't know how I could play it on a phone. Um, but what basically happens here is you have a whole bunch of different types of planes, and they're color-coded, like this is the, the helicopter that needs to go to the helipad. Once you've assigned them to where they need to go, they, they drop their color. But you have to match the plane to the appropriate space, the appropriate uh, runway. And this is just the initial grade. I'm learning that there's different planes. They need to go to different spots, make sure that they don't crash, so on and so forth. As you go throughout the game, it gets progressively more difficult to where you have more types of runways. There's more, you get a higher volume of traffic that comes in. Um, it keeps getting busier and busier. In this case, this particular level, this runway right here will change depending on the air, on the uh, which way the wind is blowing. And therefore, once this one's closed, you can no longer send traffic here. You have to send it over here. And you suddenly have to move things around. So this game, again, progressively gets more and more difficult to where ultimately now you've got an air traffic controller. People, things have to land on water, on the on the on land. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different areas. You have to, there's tons more volume. Like things go faster, slower. Like you start getting more and more difficult things starting by adding more sub skills to your current skills. So it's uh, this is an example in a game specifically traffic control that that happens, and you can probably think of it 
when it comes to something that you've been learning and you've been challenged and you like, whether it's a game or just in, in security, where you're adding sub skills on and you find yourself more and more excited and enjoy, um, you find it more enjoyable. Another way to make things more difficult in the game is to add things to the environment. In this particular case, this is Portal 2, and the the premise of Portal 2, if you haven't yet played it, um, is that you have this gun that makes two different portals. You have like an orange and a, and a blue, and you go, like if you put the door, the portal in one spot and then in another, you can go through it to get to that other spot. Um, and that's what you use to navigate around. Well, after a while, it can only be so difficult and require so much precision out of you before it gets boring. So what they start doing is they add things like this goop, and I think this is the one that's slippery. Uh, there's one that's slippery, there's one that's bouncy, there's a whole bunch of stuff, and you suddenly need that goop in certain spots in order to be able to navigate through as well with these portals. So you've added things into the environment that you have to use with your skills in order for it to still be challenging. Uh, this, this is a, a common tactic in games, especially linear games, because you are trying to make things more and more difficult, which you can imagine once you've figured out how to master both your skill and manipulating the environment to, to be the best. If you go back to not having to manipulate the environment anymore, it's just boring. So this is an, another example of how to make tasks more difficult. And then finally, you can add elements for complexity. So tools, weapons, stuff like that. Um, I have GoldenEye here again. And in the beginning, you have like just a regular gun. Or not a regular gun. You just have a handgun. Um, and eventually, this happens to be the multiplayer. You start acquiring things like the grenade launcher and more precise rifles and, and stuff like that to make things more difficult, not only for you, some of them require a little bit more accuracy, but also for your, your teammates. So for example, I remember when I would play multiplayer with a whole bunch of people and that grenade launcher would come into play, you had to now attend to the person with the grenade launcher because they, just had, they could see you from across the room, get in your general direction, and kill you. So now you have to both have your own skills, pay attention to your environment, and realize that there's a weapon out there that makes things more difficult for you. So this is all that, I, that idea of making things more difficult. This, uh, in, when it comes to changing security and changing behavior, this is where skills comes into play. This is staying up to date on what's going on, what the latest tools are, what the latest strategies are, and this adds that element of complexity to make those skills that you have and that environment that you're working in more difficult and ultimately more enjoyable. So, in, in generally in conclusion, just the overall message here is that really the idea of games and gamification and security is, is great, but it's really beyond the badge. What you have to remember with this is that you have to keep your target audience away from the ends of the curve. Whether this is you, like you could essentially try to take game theory and apply it to yourself and learning a new skill. Just make sure that you don't, like that you're doing things to make sure you're, it's not too difficult for you, so you understand your foundational skills, you're, you're getting through that, but that you're also not too bored. You're employing things to make things harder for you, make things more challenging, to keep yourself in that sweet spot. You need to know the behavior that you want to manipulate. Is this linear? Do you want somebody to start a training and go through it and finish it? You want them to start learning a skill and then get to the best? Is it a linear one? Or is it a repeated interaction one? Is this more of a nonlinear where they keep coming back to the same environment, but you need to change the skills, their coworkers. You need to send them to conferences, give them more tools, encourage creative thinking in order to keep them engaged. Uh, finally, 80% 80, 80 of your training needs can either be a time filler or gray area in design. Um, not everything has to be complete immersion, and that's, that's, that's completely fine. So recognizing that certain things are going to be one of those two will help you also appropriately require that level of intellectual stimulation. That idea of foundational information really points to how onboarding is key to getting and keeping your users, both within a game as well as with training, with security. Let's say that you're a security awareness group. Onboarding of just understanding where to go, what to do, what's required, how do I navigate is absolutely key. Because if, if somebody is left to just flounder around on a site, in an LMS, whatever it might be, without any idea of what the foundational information is, you are going to lose them very, very quickly. So onboarding is key to getting and keeping users. Create roadmaps to add sub-skills to your current skills. So for example, 
network pen testing leads to application pen testing, which leads to reverse engineering. You can use this to map out the skills trajectory of yourself, your team, your company, your employee, uh, whatever it might be, it really allows you to see the progression and therefore you can customize the content, you can customize what type of messages need to go there, uh, what type of motivators need to happen, and then go back to those previous ones. Is are these foundational pieces of information? Um, do I, you know, what what all of this needs to happen? Is this too difficult? Is this too easy? And then you can start manipulating the curves for each one of those subskills. Uh, switch team members to encourage learning and engagement. Really, that's something that a lot of people don't do. You really like that sweet spot that everybody likes to have, which just really doesn't happen as much when everybody stays in a in a comfy a comfy position. Switching things up, requiring and encouraging people to go outside of their comfort zone, whether it be with teammates or whether it be with their own in, the intellectual stimulation, really it helps to encourage learning. Uh, team play keeps employees, users, crowds, humans repeatedly engaged. So that idea of requiring people that repeated non-linear game really does require people to interact with each other and develop strategy and that keeps that idea of engagement. Provide outsourced resources, resources for users to practice their skills and do not confound extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. This was something that we brushed on very lightly, but this could be an entirely new talk, but it's, it's the pro tip of the day uh, when having any sort of reward schedule. Extrinsic rewards, things like money, shrug, um, physical objects, they're great, but they do not change. They're very hard to sustain, but they're also very easy to lose value. Intrinsic rewards like just the inherent want to be better, um, to you know intellectual stimulation, helping the company contribute to your team, those type of rewards will last much longer and will be high, much more enjoyable for those interacting with them. So the overall concept being that using gamification and using game theory to change security behavior, your behavior, any behavior, really prevents the type of thing, the lie down, try not to cry, cry a lot scenario that a lot of us can definitely, insecurity can appreciate. So I uh, appreciate your your time, and now I, I didn't give a full 15 minutes for questions, but I'm ready for questions. Peyton, are you still there? Still there? Yeah, I'm here. That was awesome, Katie. Thank you. Uh, looks like we have a couple questions in the questions pane. Um, we'll have time for a couple. Okay. Uh, the first one we have is, are you or Bug Crowd working on gamifying bug bounties? Yes, yes we, we are. are. <laughs> so I, so I, um, I can hear myself, can hear myself too. too. But anyway, but, um, Yes, a big part of what I'm doing at Bug Crowd is I, I'm coming on for behavior strategy, and part of behavior strategy is understanding what is going on with the, what what the crowd wants. And yes, creating gamification of bug bounties, um, of just the general process to be able to motivate people to just to want to want to do more. And really, this gets back to that idea of. Yeah, we have some researchers that have been doing this for years. They're amazingly talented. And being able to recognize them through stats, like we just uh, released a change in our kudos points as well as accuracy and acceptance. And those are different types of stats we use to make sure that we're not sending things that are too difficult or too easy to certain crowd members to make sure to keep them in that, in that learning curve. Also, to be honest, to motivate them to want to keep going. Money is great, yes, being paid for bug bounties is great, but there's some kudos only bug bounties. What's going to motivate somebody to still work on that? Um, also, money sometimes isn't always everything. Some people donate a lot of the money that they that they end up getting. Some of our researchers are extremely uh, extremely generous like that. So what motivates them to keep wanting to keep wanting to do more, um, to want to find the bigger bugs? What's going to be motivating for them to work harder to get a higher higher value book. So yes, we are doing that. Long story short. <laughs> and a follow-up to that one is, can we, the researchers, help? Yes, you can help. Oh my gosh, it's wonderful. Um, so I have actually been sending out to our crowd members several, a series of um, feedback 
Um, but you guys can always, my email address is up at this top right corner. If you have any feedback on anything that you're like, this motivates me, I like this, I don't like this, I want to know this metric, I want to know this stat, I don't understand this, whatever it is, always feel free to contact me at katrina.rodson at budcrowd.com. Um, I'm always open to that information. But yeah, right now I am in the middle of sending out just a variety of surveys to say, hey, um, how difficult are the bounties that you participate in? Uh, how much do you think the rewards match that level of difficulty? How well did you like this? What did you like about that? And then just giving a free form answer. So anything is, is super helpful. And honestly, even if you find examples out in the world of, in other areas where you're like, I like this feature over here, let me know. Those are all extremely helpful. The best, the best way for me to know how to make it easier for you is for you to tell me. <laughs> so always feel free to contact me. I love, I love that information, and um, I love having those conversations. Okay, okay. take maybe <laughs> one more. Um, this one is in regards to onboarding. Um, should okay. bounty okay. program owners own the responsibility of onboarding to keep users, aka researchers, or do third-party services like Bug Crowd help with this? For onboarding researchers, um, I I I think that's definitely one of the big benefits of people like Bug Crowd, third part third-party programs like Bug Crowd, um, is that we do provide with that onboarding. There's an entire team devoted to not only identifying the different places on the curve of those researchers. So some, you know, some researchers may sign up on a platform or for a bug bounty, and they've been doing this for 10 years. They don't need foundational skills. Clearly, they got it. So you don't want to just send out a blanket of that information. But we have stats on performance that allows us to identify, okay, they're good. We don't need to do that. But then we also can identify other researchers based on their bugs and their performance and their questions that may need a little bit more help. So we have people like Jason and other Jason Haddix, our director of technical operations, um, making, he's an amazing researcher, and he's starting to just provide some of his methodology to go, hey, this is what I did to get to the top. Um, we also have an amazing crowd that is contributing on the forum, that is talking to us, talking to each other, and saying, oh, hey, you, have, you need help? Great. And, but we're able to identify people that might need that help through the different stats, rather than you having to do that yourself. We're able to do that, and then we also have a team of people that are identifying the different resources that can help those people. What is the specific behavior that you're having an issue with? Is it just understanding and onboarding, or is it a more complex task? So I really do think that that's one of the benefits of a third party, is that it allows for that dynamic understanding as well as implementation of onboarding, for sure. Awesome. Time for like one more. more. Uh, we have one more. Uh, what role do in-game motivations like great job, perfect, or keep going have? And how can bug bounties adopt this sort of motivations, or should they? It's great. Uh, those, those type of motivators, they're like, hey, good job. Uh, that actually points to an intrinsic motivator. Um, those are used within a game really effectively, but as you know, uh, it, you can't overuse it. You can use those within a bug bounty, and we've actually started to do that on our platform after specific milestones. So, hey, you've just signed up. Welcome, kind of thing. And I know that's not a good job or whatever, but it is like a, hey, we noticed you. You're here. Cool. Like, good for you to sign up. After, let's say, after your first bug submission, congratulations. Here it is. Like, way to go. Keep going, uh, stuff like that. Um, so after different milestones is always a great spot, and that's some of the stuff that we've implemented. But then also kind of in the other direction, when you start see, seeing people stop doing those milestones, so maybe they were submitting you know, 20 bugs a month, and now they're down to five, then you can reach out to them and go, hey, we noticed that you used to do it this way. What about this? Like, hey, what, like, you know, how do we get you back up to that? And it really is just, it's finding those specific milestones that you want 